Hey, hey everyone, it's Paige here, a member of the SMNP team, and let's get going. So welcome back everyone. Today, let's take a look at a few picture comparisons of some oftentimes difficult to differentiate conditions that you might encounter not only on your ANCC exam, but also in your clinical practice as well. Okay, so for those of you who are not planning to take ANCC exam, please don't jump ship quite yet. We are also going to quickly walk through some key descriptors that may be used in written questions that may help you distinguish between conditions because there's absolutely going to be clues to guide you in your choice. So let's jump right in. Okay, so I know childhood exanthems are an often dreaded topic, but they really don't need to be. Let's take a look at these two rashes here. So just looking at them without a lot of background knowledge, you can see they're very different. But what exactly is the underlying diagnosis? If you don't know what to, you are looking for, this can be a daunting task to diagnose these children. Okay, so let's take a look again. So on the left, we have chickenpox or varicella. And on the right, we have measles or rubiola. Let's talk through the typical rash that we might see in chickenpox first. So this rash is going to start as small red dots on the face, the torso, maybe the upper arms, and they will quickly spread over the body. So those small dots, they will rapidly progress into bumps, later blisters, vesicles, which you'll see in the presentation on this patient here. So remember, these blisters are intensely pruritic. So on the right, we have measles. This rash looks very different from chickenpox, doesn't it? So typically the measles rash will begin on the face and it is maculopapular in nature. So we say that word a lot, right? Maculopapular, but let's refresh. What does it actually mean? So that simply just means that in this rash, we're gonna have flat parts and also raised parts. So we've got that flat red area of the skin. Then there's these raised confluent bumps or just bumps that are merging together. These bumps are not going to be fluid filled, which is definitely different from chickenpox, right? Which has those characteristic blisters. So one high point of differentiation. Also, measles rash is typically not itchy. Okay, so when we talk through this clinical picture, they couldn't seem more different, right? But what about if they were asking you a traditional style question about one of these two conditions? Would you be able to recognize the conditions based on the descriptors? Well, let's review them. So to start, the timeline of when the rash presents can really help clue us in. So with chickenpox, the overall systemic symptoms are more mild than with measles. So these patients might have one to two days of low grade fever, fatigue, headache, then the rash would appear, usually starting on the face, the torso, the upper arms, and then spreading onward. So a key phrase that might be used in a question is that these blisters and vesicles are in various stages of healing. Don't forget that itch as well. So now with measles, shifting gears a little bit, we're usually going to have a lot of clues regarding the illness history of the child, as well as other specific features of this disease. So a question would likely give you a history of high fever and those stereotypical three C's of measles. Do you remember what they are? It's cough, congestion, conjunctivitis. Then two to three days after those initial symptoms, we would see those cock-like spots in the child's mouth. Do you remember how those might be described on a question? So that would be small white spots on a reddened base on the patient's buccal mucosa. Then two or three days after that, so that would be around five days after initial symptoms, we'd see the rash that will uniquely start on the hairline or the forehead of the patient and then work its way downward. And remember, it's maculop maculopapular, blotchy. The patches will look like they're kind of blending and bleeding together, becoming confluent. So over the course of this illness, the patients are typically significantly sicker than our patients with chickenpox. Remember that. So now that we've broken these down, what's the best way to prevent both of these illnesses? Vaccines. Lucky for us, there is a vaccine for both. So hopefully we don't have to see too many of these cases in our clinical practice, right? Always wanna encourage those vaccines. 
Okay, moving right along here. So let's look at two annular or ring-shaped lesions, which can be confusing at first glance, definitely. So they both have central clearing, you'll notice. And what are you thinking about these two? With these two especially, a little bit of history from the patient can definitely clear things up a bit. But let's see if we can differentiate just by looking. Okay, so let's reveal. So on the left, we have tinea corporis, or just simply known as ringworm. Ringworm is a superficial fungal infection of the skin. It's spread through close contact with another person, maybe an animal, or even a household item like a shared towel. So we'll see erythematous papules making up the ring. It's common here to see that the edge of the skin, that ring is gonna be a little bit flaky as you can see in this picture. And also for the area within the ring and surrounding it to be a little flaky or scaly as well. So compared to pityriasis rosea, which we'll get there, ringworm is fairly well demarcated, okay? While we can see ringworm develop anywhere on the body, it's definitely more common on the arms or the legs, and it's especially common, now remember this, in hairless areas of the body. So keep in mind, ringworm, it can be pruritic. And bonus round, do you remember a definitive way we would diagnose tenia? Well, we could do a skin scraping and then perform a potassium hydroxide prep, okay? Double bonus here. What type of cream would make this lesion worse? Any ideas? Okay, you got it. Using a topical corticosteroid cream on ringworm will actually make that lesion worse, larger, angrier. So remember that. Now on to our herald patch. So the herald patch is the first sign of onco oncoming pityriasis rosea, which is thought to be brought on by a viral illness. So this lesion is also going to be a little scaly with that erythematous raised edge, very similar to ringworm, and have some central clearing as well, but it's often not as distinctively cleared as we'll see in ringworm. So our location will also help us with this as it's most common to see this develop on the chest or the back of the torso. So these can be itchy, just like ringworm. So distinguishing these two with just pictures alone can be tricky but history and more information given to us in the question can definitely hold the key. So like we discussed before, the location may help to guide us. Arms and legs are more common for tinea corporis and the chest or the back of the torso for that herald patch. Also with this herald patch, the patient might have a history of a minor viral illness prior to the patch appearing. And very distinctively, you might be told that a few days after the appearance of the herald patch, uh, they had an eruption of lesions developing along their torsos in the shape of a Christmas tree. So that will be a dead giveaway that we're dealing with a herald patch, okay? And just a little side note, a tidbit here. Do you remember that famous Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing? So when you think about a herald patch, think about that Christmas tree pattern rash erupting, right? And then think of that Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, just to help you kind of tie it all together. Just a fun little way to remember it. All right, moving right along here. So our last quick picture comparison here. So another tricky one at first glance, but with a little bit of background information, this one is actually really straightforward. So both of these look uncomfortable, definitely. Ouch, feel bad for the patients here. What are you thinking? Do you have any guesses? Okay, let's see, let's do the big reveal. So this would be rosacea and that malar rash that we will see in lupus. So there is a dead giveaway to help you distinguish between these two conditions on your exams, but we will get to that. So rosacea on the left, let's talk through that. That's going to affect the central face, usually the cheeks. The area will be red, erythematous with papules, sometimes pustules. Overall, as you can see here, it looks very angry. It looks inflammatory. We may see telangiectasias throughout the affected area. So remember, bonus round here, what are those telangiectasias? That's just a long name for visible blood vessels in the lesion. Sometimes these patients may even feel some warmth, some flushing over the area. Now that key distinguisher I do wanna point out. So rosacea does not spare the nasolabial folds. Do you see how the redness, it's confluent all the way onto the nose in the picture. 
So this will absolutely help you distinguish between rosacea and that malar rash that we see in lupus. Another tidbit that can help you differentiate as well. So this is going to be much more common to see rosacea in our fair skinned patients. Now with that malar rash, also sometimes we call it a butterfly rash on the right, this is often associated with the autoimmune disorder lupus. Um, and it's going to look more like this picture on the right. So now we won't see this in every patient with lupus, but this rash could be flat, it could be raised. This picture right here, it looks more flat um, when compared to the rosacea. We might also see it be raised. It can have more texture, can be angrier looking as well. So a key distinguisher that you'll often hear on your exams is that this malar rash associated with lupus spares the nasolabial folds, as you can see in this picture. So are you taking A, A, and P? So you're not going to have a picture to guide you. But there will be information in that question to help point you in the right direction. So for lupus, there's likely going to be additional reports of systemic symptoms, right? Like light sensitivity, ulcers in the mouth, arthritis, fatigue, so forth. And right here we have my image attributions that I used for this presentation today. And I just want to quickly add here that if you're taking ANCC and you're particularly worried about these pictures, first off, there's usually not very many. And secondly, it's likely that the pictures presented will be fairly straightforward representations of the condition. Nothing too tricky. Another tip I'd like to share with you all is to go ahead and incorporate reviewing a few picture examples into your studies now. Every time you look at a skin condition, just take a look at some examples of that. Not only will this help you for your exams, but it's also going to help you for your clinical practice. So I told you this would be a quick one. We're already done. That's it for this video. Thank you for joining. I hope this was a helpful review for you, no matter which exam you're choosing to sit for. And I hope it was also something that you'll find helpful for when you're the real deal, which will be in no time. You are almost there. We are rooting for you.